I think a lot of people look at their addiction and they look at the damage they've caused and they think, I don't know either A, how God could use this or why he would use this or why he would use me to impact others. And I think that would be just really discounting the power of what he can do. God's in the story and, and it's, you can't have a testimony without a test. People aren't successful in addiction. I, mean, I can't think of one addict that's successful. But there are successful people, and success doesn't mean money or fame. I look at it as platform and influence. And so use your platform and influence to be successful, to help other people. Your blended family has a 100% chance of success when you do it God's way. We're Blended Kingdom Families, and we want to provide biblical resources to heal and restore families with a message of hope for the next generation. Hey guys, welcome to the BKF Podcast. We are so excited you're here with us today. If you haven't already, please take an opportunity, like, share, comment, share this with somebody in your family. We would just love to continue to, um, to impact more blended families and your help and obedience could do that. Uh, today we are so blessed to have an amazing guest with us today. So Vanessa? Well, you guys, I want to welcome Eric Kennedy to the podcast. So Eric, welcome. We're so excited to have you today. Hey guys, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Yes. Well, you guys want to share a little bit about Eric and his wife, Kristen. Eric and Kristen serve their community through Stevens Creek Church in Augusta, Georgia, where they raised their three children together. Eric's first marriage failed because of addiction. He gained custody of his two sons with only nine months clean. He married his second wife, Kristen, after meeting at church and serving together. And Eric has been in recovery from drugs and alcohol for 13 years. He has a book releasing this fall with Exo Marriage called Marriage After Addiction, Take Back Your Life Together, which we are so excited about because that actually releases tomorrow on Amazon. Yeah. So if you're listening to this and after the podcast, you guys go pre-order that or order it tomorrow on day of. Yeah. Yes. It's going to be an incredible resource. Eric also hosts a podcast cover called Recovery Val, which you can see in the background there. And we've been following your podcast, Eric, and it is so encouraging and amazing. And we're just excited to hear more about your story and your blended family and, you know, just your your um, journey of just healing and overcoming addiction. So I'm excited. Yeah. So yeah. get us started, Eric. Tell us about you. Yeah, Kristen and I met uh, uh, probably 11 years ago, 11 and a half years ago. We've been married for 10 years. We just celebrated our 10 year anniversary. Um, and you're right. We started, we were serving together at Stevens Creek Church. I got an invite to the church on an Easter service. Um, you are right. I had I have custody of Cameron and Christian. They were both, uh, one was in diapers and one had just got finished potty training. Um, and I was nine months in sobriety. We, had, we were starting over from scratch and, you know, I, I had been to church in the past, but I had never really invested. And it, and for me, I think looking back, it was kind of like, um, you know, some people go to certain gyms like Gold Gym or who, whatever these gyms are. And, and it's you go to these different ones until you find the one that fits you or works with you or the, the right person that works out with you or whatever. Yeah. And I hate to compare that to church, but, you know, I had tried church in the past. Uh, I grew up in a very, very small town in South Carolina. Um, and so I was intimidated by going to a big church, but that's just where I connected. Um, I remember coming to Stevens Creek Church and I heard a little bit of recovery and 12 steps in uh, Pastor Marty's message. And the first, I believe it was probably three or four Sundays, man, I just, I was just crying and boohooing <laughs> in the room. And I'm like, what is going on? Because there was two things that I said. When I got back to the church, I said, if they speak in any kind of tongues or if they're snakes or anything like that, <laughs> their hands in the air, you know, I'm out the back door and um, they don't handle snakes. But, you know, I'm, I'm here every Sunday. I got my hands up. I'm worshiping. And I just I had an ignorance to um, or, or a fence up um, to just understanding what what the Lord had for me and, and through this opportunity to come visit this church. But uh, but I met my wife, Kristen, here at the church. Me and Cameron and Kristen started coming and I started serving. Um, and we we didn't miss us. We never missed a Sunday. We were every Sunday. And then I just uh, kind of stalked this little pretty blonde girl, um, Kristen, and uh, noticed that she had, we had some mutual friends. And, um, you know, I, I didn't have uh, a smartphone. I, I remember I had like a droid, no, no issues with droid, but it, it took a long time to find somebody on Facebook when you're, you know, using the keys, <laughs> trying to scroll with your 
finger and um, but I did. I found her and and reached out to her and was just messaging her and just um, you know thanking her for serving her. I was trying to come up with you know something. I'm I'm late thirties and this weird dude hitting on this beautiful blonde girl. But you know, I remember I, I asked her out. She said yes. Yeah. She thought I was on the welcoming committee for a little bit. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we we've been together ten years. Um, we have a little girl together, Charlie Kate. Um, Charlie Kate, six years old. Cameron's a senior in high school now. Christian's a sophomore. Uh, we live in Evans. We we love it. Uh, love it in this area. And and last year, had the opportunity to kind of meet with EXO and and talk about this project with uh, marriage after addiction. Yeah, that's awesome. Tell us about the recovery vow. Like, this is these are two words that I, I I've never seen together. So I'm I'm loving that you put them together. Mm-hmm. Um, how did this come about? Just walk us through how it came about and what it is. Sure. Okay. So every August and January at Stevens Creek Church, we go through 21 days of prayer. We, we stream Highlands out of uh, Alabama and we do 21 days of prayer. So we're in it now. This is day three. We're, we're on day three. It started on Sunday. And last August, you know, I'm, I'm 44, about to turn 45. And you know, my, my prayer life changes as, as I've gotten older. I remember asking God, okay, instead of things that I want or need or touch or bless or pray for these people, pray for that. I remember last year in August, I asked him, I said, I need you to give me a word for what you want me to, to do. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that the word he gave me was the word legacy. So at some point, you know, we plan on, you know, retiring and, um, and so my thoughts were, what, what can I give back to the church that gave me a new life? And so when I came to church here, I remember asking Pastor Marty, you know, I want to lead a recovery small group. I don't know what book to use. I didn't want to use just AA because, you know, you're not supposed to kind of use that in church. Um, and so he gave me a book called A Hunger for Healing by Keith Miller. There's a whole story that goes with that. He's from Texas. And, um, and so when I got the word legacy, I, I thought back through my past and and I have a, a, I lived a lot of life from zero to 30. I mean, I lived a lot of life, almost like a Forrest Gump, if you will, of things that I've done. Um, but there were some that were dark and some that, that weren't, but I wanted to share all of that in, in like an autobiography, if you will, that I could leave to the church that they could come in in small groups and, and read this and have a study of an actual person that went through this and then found the church. That was the, that was the, my plan. But when I gave it to God in prayer and I kind of mentioned it to a friend of mine, Dave Willis, I said, how can I apply this to, to marriages? You know, because when I got done with treatment, you know, my marriage failed and I feel like it failed. Not, I hate to say because it was supposed to, but because um, her and I are great friends. But there was nothing there for her to do. You know, I, I come out of treatment after 30 days. And it's like graduating high school. You know, it's like, okay, you're on your own. Um, but to answer your question, you know, Recovery Vow was the original name of the book. That was the, what I wanted to name the book. That's what I gave to the, the team at Exo Marriage. And it didn't have enough, I know this now from media and, and talking to publishers, but it didn't have enough words in it for like keywords and searching and all that. So like when you struggling to say marriage after addiction, take back your life together. I'm like, that's, that's a big title, Dan. Yeah. Dan. No, and but there's a reason for it. So um, I asked him, I said, well, you know, I've already kind of started this Facebook page and started talking to people about recovery vow. And so I think about recovery as, you know, the life we have once we've chosen to get out of addiction. And then a vow is a, is a covenant we make to ourselves. Like if I look up the definition of vow, it's a promise that I make to myself or it's a promise that I make to a person like a wedding at your, with your spouse. It's a promise I make to my family. So there's different ways that the word vow can be used, but there's only one way that recovery can be used. And it seems kind of opposite. Um, but the recovery vow, it just opens the door to talk about all different kinds of um, addiction, um, all kinds of recovery. Um, because if we talk about recovery and it's an interstate, all the exits and all the side roads can be the families that affected the mom and dads and how their marriage was affected brother and a sister and how that relationship's affected and or your marriage um, and how recovery in our marriage just strengthens our marriage if we let it you know and so that's kind of where recovery bow came from it, it, it became it was the name of a book 
um, from uh, a thought of uh, an autobiography, but grew into this, what it is now. Um, and now it's just a brand. And so under the brand recovery vow is a podcast, the book and this train the trainer classes and a grant we're applying for and just, so that's, that's kind of the gist of it. And all that happened in 11 months. <laughs> yeah. 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 God can move pretty quick when he's, when he's got the right vision and, and got the right people to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just been crazy walking through these doors. So, but that's kind of, that's the, the basis of where recovery valve came from. I love that. And I love that, you know, uh, at the core of that, it's obedience of, of using your story and God pushing you in a direction to say, this is something that is needed and mm -hmm. your story is going to be used. Um, I can't imagine that you thought that 15 years ago or through through even addiction that you thought that God would use that as 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 a calling on your life. I'm I'm curious if as you've kind of set this out, how this has affected your marriage, how it's affected you as a parent. Um, walk me through kind of what that looks like for you. And and really in, in the words of the people who are listening to this, I know a lot of people who are listening to our podcast have gone through addiction. Or maybe they're in the middle of addiction. Or have a spouse. Yeah. Or a spouse yeah, that's in addiction. With it. Yeah. Um, but kind of walk us through kind of what that looks like as it, it affects you as in your marriage and in your parenting now. So, you know, it, in the beginning, I was uh, nervous about who I was going to be. Um, you mentioned I, I was nine months in when I, when I was awarded custody of the boys. And so I had no idea what I was doing. You know, I, I knew that I needed to work. I knew that I needed to feed, clothe, and keep these two kids alive. And that I'm a really good dad, but I suck as a mom, you know, I mean, I, I, <laughs> and we were washing clothes on Sunday and you dig it out the pile during the week and I'll throw it in the dryer and that's how we iron it. We're going to eat Mexican for dinner. You're having Pop-Tarts for breakfast and school's going to provide a lunch. And that's how it, that's how it went. And it was almost like I accepted that to be the life that we were going to live because the life I, I had accepted before that was, well, you're just going to be a suicidal drug addict, you know? And so, this new change, even though it doesn't sound glamorous, was a lot better than the previous, you know? And so I just kind of got out of the way. Um, and, and I started, when I started going to the church, I found myself at nighttime after tucking the boys in, I would, I would lay hands on that old beater truck that, that I bought, um, after saving up scrounging or cars breaking down, I would go out and just thank God for that truck. And we moved, I remember moving from an apartment into our first house. I remember, put hands on the bricks of the outside of the house and just thanking God for it. And I think blessing came from that because I was thanking him for the bad that, that had happened or the things that aren't that great and glamorous because he had something in store that was coming. And it was going to be something that was better than what it was, better than where I'm at now. And even probably, I would say in increments of years or two years, you know, each, each year, each day got better, each month got better. Um, and so you move forward through these last 14 years. And if I haven't, if I didn't get out of my own way or, um, just try to lay into God and keep him in the center of everything I was doing along with my recovery, you know, these, these boys wouldn't, you know, be doing what they are now. I may not have had custody of them. Um, Kristen wouldn't have wanted to go out with me. Um, and Charlie Kate wouldn't be here. So recovery plays a huge part in how I parent. Um, because as the boys have gotten older, um, you know, we've, we've had talks of, you know, we had the, I remember the sex and the Santa talk at an early age because they were already hearing about it at school. And I was, I'm like, well, I got to get out in front of this. So we started having, you know, I wouldn't say grown up conversations, but we would have next level conversations in that, or at an early age. And there's a lot of my story that they still hear now that they don't know about, but I didn't shy away from sharing things. Um, that I've done that I'm not proud of because I wanted them to understand that I've done that for them. Now I can't keep that. I can't keep them from doing, you know, they have, they have their own self free will as they get older, but I share things that I walk through so that um, they know that I'm a real person and that, you know, it, it, it can be generational. And so I really think that helped a lot. You know, we, we, we got invested in, in church and so they serve and, and go to church here and, and we we try to be as Christ centered as possible. You know, are we perfect? Absolutely not. Um, am I a perfect husband? Absolutely not. Um, am I a perfect dad? No. But we just continuously try and we just we don't shy away from conversations. Now, do I tell them 
all the bad? No, there are certain things I'm going to take to the grave. But when it comes to how Kristen and I parent or the conversations we have in front of them or with them and what we include them in as they've gotten older, I feel like I'm setting them up for success because I want them to see this is how you do life. And there's a side of life you can take that exit off of the recovery you know, interstate, you can take these different roads and, and, and mess things up, but you can also come back to it. Um, so I just want to keep them on the interstate, I guess is the best way to say it. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Well, and you know, I, I know that there are some people who are listening right now, maybe they have children, you know, that are stuck in mm -hmm. ejection or, you know, like we said, your spouses, or maybe someone who's listening right now is they're yeah. stuck in addiction. And, you know, I know that that can be super frustrating because we, we counsel and we coach couples that, they're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get my spouse help, or I don't know how to get myself help. And so, you know, what advice, Eric, or just encouragement and practically and spiritually, would you give those families who either have a family member or they themselves are stuck in this cycle of addiction and they, they just, they're at a loss. They don't know what to do or where to go from here. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if it's, if you're not the person, but you, you want somebody to get, you know, find sobriety or, or they have an issue with addiction, there's there's two questions I have to ask um, every person that comes to me. Um, and, I, and I hate these are one of, I hate one of the questions. But the first question is, well, do they want it? Mm -hmm. You know, because we're just, we're just talking about it yeah. until they want it. And the other question is, do, do they have insurance? Because insurance or finances will kind of dictate, you know, the level of care you can get. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of great places that offer some um, inpatient treatment, um, spiritual guidance, but you have to work to find those places. And I always encourage people to go out of state because then it's an, you, you can't easily just escape from it. I remember them teaching me that I went to Florida for treatment and I said, why am I got to go to Florida? Yeah. And they said, well, if you get the itch, you can't just walk out there on the street because you have no idea where you are. You know, yeah. they pick you up at the airport and they, they bring you in. And I would say that I would want the same thing. So everybody that that I've ever helped, I've always pushed them to go somewhere. And if they want me to help them find it, I'll help them find it. But usually if they just call the number on their insurance card, that'll tell them the places they can go. Now, to go back to your question, the second part of it, if they are the person that is in the addiction, it's kind of the same thing. That they've got to want it. And then just the first step is admitting you've got the problem, you know, and then asking for the help to go through it. So if they're ready to go through it, if they have a loving and caring family, then that family will help them walk through it. But you may have also burned some bridges through your addiction. And so people may not believe you or hear you. And so it's going to take some work on your part. And that just kind of comes with time, things I must earn. Um, and so it just, it, sometimes it takes time. Yeah. I, I, it's your story. And, and I think people who are listening, that relate to your story. Um, when we talk about addiction, it always hits a very personal note. Mm -hmm. um, I know that it, it has been a huge part of my story, not personally addiction, but alcohol, the tragedy that comes with it, it is, it is an absolutely, it is part of the, the story that I tell. My mother was an active alcoholic. I mean, I think both my parents probably uh, yeah, were. Both were. But my mother was. Um, my mother wasn't. Uh, I remember her leaving for treatment. I remember wow. at a very young age her being shipped away. It's almost like she was just mm -hmm. she was forcefully taken to treatment. Um, was it like an intervention style, Scott, or was it because she wanted to, or do you remember? You know, I, I, I don't, I don't know why I, I, I will tell you my parents, you know, and, and uh, Vanessa and I talk about this a lot. I, I don't know how my parents stayed married. I don't, I, they were off the chain mm -hmm. crazy. Um, but she was an alcoholic. She went, you know, went away for treatment, got sober. Uh, and, and then years later, um, my, my older sister was killed by a drunk driver in a drunk driving accident. When I was 14, she was 16. And then I watched what God did after the story. Mm -hmm. I watched uh, I watched my mother faithfully serve Jesus for, I don't know, 30, 40 years until she died. She died. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched her, you know, go on to, 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 to lead Mothers Against Drunk Driving and, 
I saw tons of things that God did because of tragedy. And so I think if I could encourage anybody, and I think you would probably say the same thing, Eric, I think a lot of people look at their addiction and they look at the damage they've caused and they think, I don't know either A, how God could use this or why he would use this or why he would use me to impact others. And I think that would be just really discounting the power of what he can do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, God's in the story and, and it's, you can't have a testimony without a test. I know these all sound like little clips, yeah. but yeah. it's the truth. Uh, and um, everybody can be used. And he uses, he uses the broken. I mean, yeah. that's how he, that's how he keeps the healed or gets the people healed, and 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 other people that are broken that are. He does it through testimony. He does it through stories, like like you sharing that about your mom. And I didn't know that, um, and I'm sure she she went on and helped numerous people. So. People aren't successful in addiction. I, mean, I can't think of one addict that's successful. But there are successful people, and success doesn't mean money or fame. I look at it as platform and influence. And so use your platform and influence to be successful, to help other people. Um, that's kind of the 12th step. Yeah. I love that. Well, and I, I love, you know, when you hit on it earlier, Eric, when you said, you know, when you, you said that you, you've, you've shared with your with your sons and your children and because you got the word legacy and like, what is that going to look like in, in the future? And that you don't want that to be a part of their story either. You don't want that to be passed on generationally. Um, you know, I come from a family that Scott and I both do. We, we say that uh, our families put the fun in dysfunctional. Um, it's kind of like our, our ongoing joke, but uh, my, my mom left my, so my biological father, I don't know him, never met him, but he was a drug addict and sold drugs. And so one day my mom just moved us out of the house. Like he went to work and she found drugs in the house and, and she took us and left. And unfortunately that was a part of my story when I was in college. And I, I shared this at our blended family conference last year, but I got into some really hardcore drugs and had an issue with it. And I will never forget calling my stepdad of all people. My stepdad is a recovering alcoholic um, for decades. And I remember um, coming off of a high and calling my dad mm. and just being like, dad, I've been strung out for so many days and like, I can't do this anymore. And he was like, baby, come home. And just having that love and support, but had he not shared with me what he had gone through, I didn't reach out to my mom. Um, my mom is a, a constable. My dad was a marshal at the time. So growing up in that household, I was like, nope. But because my dad had shared what he had gone through, he was that lifeline for me in, at that time. And, you know, my parents were so gracious and, you know, um, opened their arms to me. They were like, we can get you the help that you need and, you know, whatever, whatever. And now, you know, the life that the redeeming and the redemption that God has done and how, mm. you know, Scott and I in our marriage, how, how we, we've decided like that stops with us and we don't want that to be a part of, of the Martindale legacy and a part of our son's lives and the things that we do differently in our home that our parents didn't do or, you know, the generations before. And so I love that that you said that you talk about it because I think so many people are fearful too out of like what their kids might think. Um, yep. But I think that is, it's such a proactive way to, um, to help prevent that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because like hearing both of you guys kind of share a little bit of your story, you, you're like me, you, you want to be generational breakers, right? You don't yeah. want this to go on through you or be responsible for, you know, the generation after you or the generation that follows you. I mean, you have a, you're making an impact in marriages. Um, and you're also making an impact in your, in your marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I That's love that. So good. All righty. So we're coming to the end of our time together. Uh, we were definitely going to pick this up again. I think there's more oh, that for we sure. can, uh, <laughs> can gather so with you more. guys. And, um, and I'm sure our audience, you know, this is part, because we're a blended family podcast and blended family ministry, we look at a lot of issues that impact blended families. Addiction is one of the most, you know, it's the one of the most prevalent. So I know our audience is going to to feed into this, and they're going to need this information. So I want to, we're going to end with a question, and then I'm going to talk about uh, where folks can find your book and yep. make sure they can do that. So 
The last question we always ask, this is a staple question for us, is the name of our ministry is Blended Kingdom Families. Eric, what is a blended kingdom family to you? If I had to define the Kennedy family as a blended kingdom family, it would be um, we are a mess of people, but we are true to our faith. We are not perfect. We all carry some kind of little bit of baggage when we come to the dinner table at nighttime. Not all of us make it to the dinner table at nighttime. Some are playing a video game and they're late. Some are <laughs> you know, having a bad day and they just sit in the car music, listen to music. Or Charlie Kate's the only one talking. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking about dinner last night. Whenever there's no night that's perfect, but there's the perfectness is in the imperfection, and it's because we did come together for dinner and we shared, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. They had somebody to turn to when they get done doing whatever they're doing. Um, not everything happens on time and on purpose with the purpose, but we serve each other and we love each other. And we walk through these different seasons of life with God out in front as much as possible. I try to lead as best I can. Do I do the absolute greatest job of that? No, I'm always going to hear another dad say, Oh, I read prayer cards with my daughter this morning. <laughs> Or, you know, I opened the Bible and I read to my children last night. You know, I can't say I do that, but I have a faith in Christ. I have a belief in Jesus, and they know that. That's good. Well, I love that you paint a picture of hope and paint a picture of yeah. some goodness. Because I think a lot of people, it's like, a, it's like coming out of a dust cloud of, you know, when you're in addiction, that's all you see. Yeah. And yeah. the clearing is in the obedience of choice of saying, I'm, I'm choosing to do something mm -hmm. different. I'm choosing to rebuild. I'm choosing to um, re-enter a life that God has for me uh, that is free from addiction. So I know people, I know people who are listening to this are in that. Yeah. So tomorrow is this very special day. Yep. This is the release of your book, Marriage After Addiction, Take Back your life together. Yes. Um, so this comes out tomorrow. You can order it on Amazon. You can also order it on XO, XO, yeah. uh, XO Marriage. Marriage .com. Um Final thought, Eric, what do you want people to get from this book? I want people to know that this book is written to the spouse. Um, it's written as a workbook. It's 13 very practical chapters on everything from understanding what an addict is, help my spouse as an addict is the first chapter, um, communication, how to, how to talk to your spouse, how the, uh, the person in recovery needs to talk to their spouse. Um, there's one chapter in there that just talks about letting laughter return to your marriage, because when I can make my wife laugh, it opens up or tears down walls to open up conversation for hard conversations that maybe have been kind of buried. Um, or even things that maybe happened last week, it just helps you have that those walking around steps, those maintenance steps that you may learn in, in treatment. Um, but there's every, everything is in there, um, but it's written in a very practical way. Um, sex, um, it's got clinical backing, um, communication we talked about. And then at the end of every chapter, there's a set of questions for the person recovered to answer. And then there's a set of questions for the spouse to answer. And then there's a set of questions for you to answer together. Uh, one, one, one of my favorite chapters is marking your time and sobriety together. Um, it creates this date night. So like when I was going through treatment, I would get a chip for 30 days or 60 days, you know? And so now, because you're both in recovery together, it's not just, I went through 30 days of treatment and I'm back home and I'm the one going through it. And I've got to have this selfish mindset of going to so many meetings a day or doing this IOP or going to see this LPC. If I'm really wanting to do the work. I need my, my spouse to kind of go along with me and, and defining that uh, through date nights and celebrating those milestones together and being the, the, the 10% that make it, you know, I feel like as a couple, if we're doing this together, we, we take that 10% and we blow that up and we want to become like 50 or 60% of couples that, that make it and, and, and a beating addiction. Love that. Awesome. Good. Well, Eric, can you tell everybody where they can find you, um, your podcast, and yeah, where, where they can find more information about you? So we would love for you to uh, find Recovery Vow on YouTube. You can subscribe and watch all of our uh, video uh, episodes there. Um, we are also on all of our uh, different streaming platforms. We use Podbean, so it goes on Spotify, Apple, Amazon. Um, we are on Instagram, and TikTok. We're trying to be cool and hip, so we're TikTok. 
And then, then the old people's Facebook page, we have a Facebook page. And, you know, like I said, we just want to use a platform that's been given to us to give people an opportunity to come in as anonymously and listen to stories. So we, we, we have people on the show or on, on our episodes. We talk to a lot of married couples, what life was like in addiction, the dark, the ugly. And then we talk about recovery. Um, we have a judge that comes on. We have just some friends of mine that talk. We have moms and dads who lost their kids in addiction or still have their kids from a, you know, that went through addiction and how that affected their marriage um, that are, you know, thinking about getting married. And so, and we talk about the book a little bit. So there's kind of no holds barred. Uh, if it's got anything to do with recovery or making a commitment, we're going to talk about it. So good. So we're, good. We're so thankful that you yes, thank took you time so with much. us today. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad I could uh, hang out with you guys. I really appreciate you guys. I've got to know you guys through uh, the EXO team over the last year. And I thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And I look forward to kind of serving with you in this, this coming season. Oh, thank you, Eric. Yeah. And we feel the exact same. Yeah. Well, you guys, thank you so much for tuning in today and joining us on the podcast. And um, if you haven't already, you guys, we would love for you to leave a review. Give us your feedback. Um, let us know what it is that you would like for us to talk about in the future. But we hope you have an amazing and blessed day. Guys, take care. Hey, friends. So glad you were here with us today. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can find more resources from Blended Kingdom Families at BlendedKingdomFamilies.com. Join us again next time as we talk about more blended family topics. Be blessed in all that you do. And remember, nothing will be impossible with God.